And it was indeed Moses' desire, his deepest desire, to have God not only speak to him, but he wanted to see him face to face. If you want to follow along in your, your scriptures, there are in some in the pulpit, excuse me, some in the, in the pews in front of you. If you brought them along, that's good. If you brought them in your phone, that is the only reason I'm going to let you use your phone. No, not true. But I want you to know that Facebook wasn't invented for Moses. It was invented for you. And the person that Moses wanted to see most in his life, the one he wanted to have you know, on his Facebook page, was God. And so I'm coming out of Exodus chapter 34 today, but I'm telling you that the story begins in 32. And boy, oh boy, oh boy, it's not a good story. It's the story about the calf who jumped out of the fire. Kids, have you ever had this as your bedtime story? <laughs> Probably not. Because this, my friends, was an epic fail. It was an epic fail of leadership and his name well, he was actually Moses' older. Isn't older supposed to be wiser? Older brother. And while Moses was up on the mountain and asking God if he could see his face because this was what he wanted, most of all, his deepest desire was to see God's face. Aaron was down with the people and they got bored because Moses took long. Do you ever feel that way about your parents when they are shopping at Walmart? Yeah. When are we going home? And that's, you see, why your mother usually sends you on a, on a mission to find something. Because she knows you're bored and she knows that you want to leave. Well, that's how the Israelites felt. Moses is up there. What's happened to him? He's been there for almost 40 days. And so... They got restless, and they went back to the things that were around them and also the things that they were used to from where they had come from. Where had they come from? They had come from Egypt, where they did not worship God from heaven. They worshiped idols. And so Aaron got kind of scared, and he thought, you know, how am I going to take care of these people? They're bored. They're getting restless. And so he did what popped into his mind first. He said, bring me all your gold jewelry. Now, we're out in the desert, as Kit was saying. The people of Israel are out in the desert. Where did they get this gold jewelry from? Anyone? The people in Egypt, remember the ten plagues, and the last plague was that the firstborn of every household that did not have the blood on the doorposts and the lintel, they lost their firstborn. And so when the people of Israel came to them and said, which God instructed them to do, we need payment for the last 400 years, the Egyptians said, sure. And they gave them, they gave them their gold and their silver and, and, and everything. But oftentimes these things were in the shape of idols. But Moses, uh, Aaron's, Aaron's taking Moses' place for the moment. And so he, he says, bring me your gold. And he takes the gold and he, he this, is, this is what he says. Do you, do you want to read it with me? I, I think it's, it's, worth, it's worth reading. Because it is such a wonderful adult story. Are you ready? This is chapter 32, verse 24 of the book of Exodus. Okay? So I told them. This is now Aaron reporting to Moses what happened. Because Moses wants to know, this is an epic fail, what happened? 
Whoever has some gold jewelry, take it off. He says, then they gave me the gold and I, I threw it into the fire. You ready for what's next? Because this is the most amazing part. And out came a calf. Now, when I went to Pathfinders, I had a very strong uh, English accent, actually South African accent, and the, la- the man who took me to Pathfinders always wanted me to say, hi, Mr. Willis. Um, I want you to say this phrase. Down the road, about a mile and a half, I met a calf taking a bath. Now, do you see why he wanted me to say it? Because he was from West Virginia, where they said, down the road, about a mile and a half, they met a calf taking a bath. You see, so he thought my way of saying it was kind of strange. Down the road, about a mile and a half, they met a calf taking a bath. Funny accents, aren't they? But this calf, this golden calf, according to Aaron, jumped out of the fire. Yeah, right. Disney didn't make this calf. No, uh uh-uh, uh-uh. This this calf now was a golden calf, and what happened next was the people started rushing around and around and around this calf, worshipping this calf, saying that this was their god. Now, this whole month, we have been talking about the heart of God. H-E-A-R, today, my friends, because it's leap day, we have five Sabbaths in the month of, of this month of February, and it's leap day. Any, anyone going to dare to be proud of being born on leap day? I have one friend in England, I think he's seven now. <laughs> Chris heard of a doctor who, delivered, who was himself born on leap day, who delivered a, a young girl on uh, leap day, and then four years later delivered her sister. And today they're having a party to see, he's, a, he's an OBGYN, they're having a party to see who else is going to be born on leap day. And they're going to have a birthday party on their, on their birthday. He's going to bring them into the world, and then they're going to have a party. Because getting born on this particular day is, is pretty special, isn't it? So I want to give a shout out to Philip Barham. I didn't know that there was a whole street in L.A. named after Barham. Is there a special Barham in in L.A. history? I don't know, but come see us again, Philip. He lives in England, so it's going to be a long time maybe before he does Route 66 again, which is what he did. He came to this country, did Route 66, ended right there on the pier uh, down by the ocean, and then came and stayed with us for a few nights. But it's his birthday today because it's leap day, okay? And so this, this calf, this calf becomes something that really breaks the heart of God. He has chosen this people. They have been in captivity for over 430 years. He has rescued them from Egypt where they were slaves, where they were nothing. They were were of no benefit to the Egyptians except that they were the ones who moved the mud to the brick making and then moved the stones to the pyramids. That's the only use that the Egyptians had for them. That little phrase that you read in Genesis where it says that there was a new Pharaoh that came around after the one that knew Joseph. There was a new Pharaoh that came that did not know Joseph, did not have the deal in his mind that the previous Pharaoh had made with Joseph and his family. But his family didn't leave, and so that's where it all began. And God made a deal with Joseph's family a long time before, and here now, after the slavery is over, they're in the place where God is now going to show them himself. He's going to, to, to open himself up to them by giving them the commandments. At this very moment is when they choose to think not of their God who has loved them and saved them. He, he's the least that they're thinking about because Moses, his representative, is, 
is delayed. Moses, his representative, is, is, is busy elsewhere, and because they can't see Moses, they want to see something else. And so what do they look at? They look at the calf who jumped out of the fire. Yeah, right. I think there was a goldsmith that might have been involved. But that's not how Aaron tells it. Moses saw that the people were running wild. Kids, what happens when you run wild? Consequences, right? Well, folks, just to make this G-rated, because the next part is not G-rated, he asks, who is with me and the Lord? And the tribe of Levi rallied, the Bible says, to Moses. And in response to that, he tells them to do something that heretofore would never have been done within the family of God. He actually instructs them to strap on their swords and to start dealing, code word, adults, this is a an adult code word, dealing with the people who were running wild. The Bible tells us that there was an interesting number, and for those of you Bible scholars out there, numbers are important. Can you think of a New Testament number that might be 3,000? Because that's how many people were dealt with by the Levites, 3,000. So isn't it interesting that on the day of Pentecost there were 3,000 that were found, that were added? Isn't that interesting how the Bible kind of balances itself out? Numbers are important in the Bible. Don't forget that. The Levites did what Moses commanded. Well, verse 30, the next day Moses said to the people, you have committed a great sin. And I'm just going to say it again. I've said it before. Sin, in my definition, is the breaking of a relationship. There, are sin, there is sin and there is sins. Sin is the breaking of the relationship. Sins are the things that happen when you have a broken relationship relationship. See how that works? They had broken their relationship with God. They had said, he's delayed up there, and so we are going to ask Aaron to make us another God that we can worship, that we can give credit to for our lives and our, and our situation. And that broke their relationship with God, and as a result, they ran wild. Now, if you don't see that in the papers, if you don't see that on the news today, then you don't know what's going on out there, okay? But those of you who commute to L.A., I'm just going to say, hallelujah, you're here again on Sabbath, because there are, every one of us know that there are moments when, uh, like the lady who was sitting near to me in a restaurant this week, she was talking about the fact that the guy next to her was not watching. He was probably doing something on his phone, and he drifted into her lane. That's all it takes. And suddenly, you are in the news as the car that's burning on the 405, or the 101, or the 210, or so is it not a miracle that we are sitting here again unharmed? Is it not something the people of Israel should have realized? He just brought us out of Egypt. Can we not wait a few days for him? No. Instead, they, they dance and cavort and go out of control. Moses melts the calf, and he makes the people drink it. And then the Lord, verse 31 of chapter 32, oh, what a great sin these people have committed. They have made themselves gods of gold. Yes, I know the stock market has dropped. 
Yes, I know we're worried about our gold. But is that who takes care of us? Come on now. I know you looked at your portfolio. They made themselves gods of gold. But now, this is, this is now Moses, but now please forgive their sin. But if not, are you ready for this? Are you ready to be like Moses? Some people say, yes, I want to be like the patriarchs. I want to be like Moses. I am sure that you're going to rethink that after you read the next part of the sentence. Because Moses says, if you don't forgive them, then blot me out. I have a very dear friend who has now decided that this applies to the people that he loves on this earth, many of whom are not Christ followers. And he has told God, if they're not going to heaven, I don't want to go either. It's kind of a different attitude, right? To the attitude that I grew up with, which said, Oh my goodness, if you're not one of us, you're not going, and I don't really care. Did any of the rest of you grow up with that attitude in the church? Oh, you are, fill in the blank. You're not going to heaven. Sorry for you. That was not Moses' attitude in this moment, folks. Moses' attitude was, is God, if you're going to blot them out for their sin, which they deserve, then take me too. I don't want to go to Canaan. I don't want to go to Canaan without these people, God. And in the rest of the story, you have Moses arguing with God to forgive his people. <clears throat> Even when God says, I'm going to make a new nation from you and your family, Moses. The one that you, that you got when you ran off into Midian and married the priest's daughter. Those two boys that your, that your wife brought to you while you were leading the people of Israel through the desert, I'll make a new family with your family. And Moses says, no, God, no. When was the last time you had a, a talk with God where you told him no? He then makes a very wonderful legal argument for God, saying, God, remember, uh, <clears throat> the people around us here are watching what's happening with your people. If you kill them, the people around are going to go, oh, what kind of God is this who kills his own family? God, are you sure that that's what you want to do? And you read in chapter 32 that he relented, he relented, he decided, okay, I won't. But those who have sinned will be punished, if not now, at another time. Interesting, interesting attitude that we find with Moses. He, he continues this attitude with God uh, in chapter 33. There's a, there's a phrase there that I have... I have circled in my Bible. It's God speaking now, and he's talking about Canaan, and, and he's saying, you know what? I'm going I'm to honor my promise to you, and I'm going to send you to Canaan. But you know what? Because of what you guys have done to me, I'm not going with you. Do you, do you, feel, do you feel just a little bit this morning in the story, the heart of God? Our three words are tabernacle, truth, time. Here you have a God who has chosen, chosen to live with his people, which is the idea of tabernacle. That word is to live with, to dwell with. And this is the result. In a moment when he is not totally visible, when he's up on the mountain with Moses, they're back with their previous love, with their previous gods, and they're cavorting around and they are in total chaos. 
I will not go with you. Moses, Moses then goes on a, on, a, on a jag to try and convince God, we cannot go into Canaan without you. If, we're, if, if you're not going to go with us, then we're not going to go. It's interesting, it's interesting that Moses in, in, in chapter 33, verse 16, says this. And I, and I, and I, want, I want Adventists to hear this very specifically. Because we, we feel that we are a distinguished, I'm going to use that word because it's the one in the Bible, we are a distinguished group in the family of Christendom. Have you ever stopped to think what distinguishes us from the rest of the peoples? That's your Sabbath homework. Okay, that's your Sabbath homework because Exodus 33 verse 16 says, How will anyone know that you are pleased with me, this is Moses speaking to God, with your people unless you go with us? God, how will people know that we're back in a relationship? Even though, <clears throat> just like on Facebook, it's complicated, but you're back in a relationship. How will people know unless you go with us? And then, then he makes this huge argument, and he uses this big word beginning with D. Ready? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? Moses is making a huge point for us here today, my friends. He is saying, if we are not with God, if God is not with us, if God is not the head of our family, if he is not together with us, what difference does it make that you are a Christian or an Adventist? Okay? This is soul-searching time, folks. We're talking about the heart of God. We're looking at a situation in which the people of God have ripped God's heart out and Moses is trying the best he possibly can to try and get God back together with his people, not kill them, not leave them behind, but to tabernacle, to tabernacle with them, to live in their midst. What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? Verse 17, and the Lord said to Moses, I will do, watch this, <laughs> when God says I will do, you've got to know what he says next, the very thing you have asked. Maybe we could have a testimony meeting some other time, but I bet that we could have testimony right now and there'd be people sitting right next to you who could say to you, I have asked God for something specific and he gave it to me. Then you'd be like Moses. And this is why I'm going to do it, God says, because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. Tell you what jumps to mind right this very second. Right this very second. What was the phrase that the bridegroom used to the bridesmaids who were late to the wedding supper? I do not know you. Okay, same word, same word. What happens to the people in Revelation chapter 3? What, what happens to them? They get a new name. I know you by name, and that name is my name too. This is God speaking. He's not John Jacob Jingleheimer Smith, but he might as well be. He's saying, your name is the same as my name. I know you by name. You are part of my family. This is the third commandment, remember? Don't take the Lord's name that's the family name. 
Don't take the family name and throw it in the dirt and stamp on it by what you have done before. Don't do that again. I'm pleased with you, Moses, because you're saying we're not going to do that anymore. We want to be your people. We want to go to Canaan. We want to inherit what you have said. We want you to keep your promise to us, and we will keep our promise to you. We will be faithful. God says, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. And this is when, this is when Moses comes apart. He is overcome. He is overcome with his deepest desire in his relationship with God. And he says these words, which I believe God granted him, not now, but later. He, he says, Lord... Now show me your glory. And my friends, if, 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 I, could just, if I could just say, this, this is the attitude, this is the motivation that we need to have today. That whatever decisions we make, whatever uh, future we can think about, stock market be damned, sorry. Whatever future we can think about, we need to be thinking, what will this do? Will this help me to see God's glory? Will people see the glory of God through me? Will God say, I am going to do this for you because I know you by name? Let's not get hung up in all this discussion about, oh, I, I don't know if I'm part of the 144,000, you know, because they're special. Do you know what makes you special? It makes you special that God knows that you and him have the same name, that you're part of his family. That's what makes you special, and that's what Moses is saying here. God, unless you go with us, how will anyone know that we're special? lovely little song in the 70s, they will know we are Christians. They will know what family we are part of, my friends. Why? Because we keep the seventh day? No. They will know we are Christians by our love. It's the love of the Father, it's the love of the Son, it's the love of the Holy Spirit that flows through us that people know. Some people call it an aura. Okay, fine, whatever, whatever. I'm just going to call it the thing that people feel that, that when they're in your presence is the glory of God. It's not your glory. You don't care about your glory. When is it going to be that we do not care about our glory, our church, our this, our that? We need to say, I don't want to see our glory. I want to see God's glory. This was Moses' deepest desire in his relationship with God. And I'm going to tell you the truth. There's our next word. It should be that we want to see the goodness of God because that's what he tells him next in verse 18, verse 19. I will cause all my goodness. Wouldn't, wouldn't this just be so exciting? I, I, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on them whom I will have mercy and I will have compassion on those that I will have compassion on. But, he said, you cannot see my face. This very deep desire that you have to look in my face and see me face to face, Moses, you can't have that. But this is what I'm going to do for you. For no, no one, no person may see me and live. It's my pet theory that this is exactly what happened on the top of Mount Nebo some years later. He who has ears let him hear what I just told you. I think God gave Moses what he wanted because he was 120 years old and the Bible says he was strong. So why did he die on the top of Mount Nebo? Well, I think God met him there and gave him what he wanted. He looked into his face 
and this text came true. No person in their current state of being can look into the face of God and live. I think Moses died in the arms of God, but that's just my pet theory. There is a place near me where you may stand. Kit didn't know all that I was going to say this morning, but she talked about the rock. Are you ready for this? Because this is New Testament as well, right? This is Jesus speaking when he says that he is the rock upon which he will build his church. It's right here in the Old Testament as well. It's right here in Exodus, and it's God talking to Moses who wants nothing more than to see his glory. He says, you may stand on the rock. And I will put you then in the cleft of the rock. So God's going to split this rock wide open. He's going to put his person in there. So not only will we stand on the rock, but we will be surrounded by, we will be protected. We will be inside the rock. Paul talks about it a lot. He calls it being in Christ. Well, here is Moses in Christ. Christ, he's in the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand, and you will see my back. So yes, <laughs> Moses got to see the back of God. Not his face, but his back. And that's where the story takes an interesting turn. Because you see, the truth about God is that he really would like, as I've said in my synopsis, he really would like to call time. He'd like to say, it's done. <laughs> you know, we're finished. Jesus, Jesus really wants to come. At the moment, we believe through study of Scripture that he is standing beside the right hand of the Father, and he is asking one question. God, when can I go get them? When can I go get them? And he told his disciples that only the Father knows the answer to that question. Now, I believe the Father and the Son are one, so I think the Son knows too, but he is still there and he is still asking, when can I go get my kids? When can I go get my family? And he's, he's, he's waiting because he wants no person to ever be able to say that they didn't have a chance to choose to be together with him forever. So the Lord gives the people another chance. And he gives Moses the opportunity, he gives Moses the opportunity to make another set of stone tablets. And and he, he, basically, he basically writes again. I've, I've looked at a couple of texts here because they're both in chapter 34, and, and it's chapter 34, 1, and then also chapter uh, 34, verse 28. And I'm, I'm a little confused, I must admit, as to who exactly did the writing. I'm going to believe it was the finger of God on the tablets of stone that Moses was instructed to cut out this time. But you see, symbolically, symbolically, Moses had taken these tablets, and in his anger, when he came down the mountain and saw the people all cavorting around, having given up on God and their relationship with him, he had taken these tablets, and he had smashed them on the ground. So he was given the task, as I think we have all been given the task, to make those tablets again, to write them on our hearts, the fleshy tablets on our hearts so that the character of God, his very essence, his relationship that he wants to have with us, the tabernacling that God wants with us can be personal. And so Moses makes another set of tablets and God writes his relational instructions on them. And we still have them today. We still have them today, especially if you, I suppose, cling, cling to the right Bible. I know there are many who have problems with various translations and all that kind of thing. I do too, actually. Some, some of you may be surprised to say that because there are some uh, particular Bibles that have changed the Ten Commandments. And if you need to know, 
more about that, I can tell you. But I won't tell you now, okay? There are Bibles that have changed the Ten Commandments, okay? So you do need to be careful when you read and what you read. That's why I have all the Bibles. <laughs> you go to my office, you go to my house, I've got lots. And if you get them on your phone, you can get lots too. And they can all be on your phone, which is a very wise thing to do. God, God comes to Moses and he makes this deal again. It's because he wants to call the end. So I'm going to call the end by reading you this last piece of scripture. I'm going to the end of the Bible, and you can come with me to Revelation 21. You ready? Then I saw a new heaven, say it with me, and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. That's my father-in-law for you. He's the paleontologist in the family, and he's the one who is a marine biologist who can tell you his theory about what happened at the flood and how things got torn apart with the waters that came down and the floods that came up. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, the world is not going to look like it does when he makes it again. There are, no going to, there are not going to be seven seas like we have now. There's not going to be any sea. There may be some big lakes, because we like looking at lakes, right? And he wants to make us happy. But the crust of the earth will be reinstated and the waters that are under the earth are going to go back, I believe. Just my theory. You can poke at it if you like. I don't care. I love dialogue. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Have we not been talking about the heart of God? Have we not been talking about how God feels about us? This is how God feels about us. He is wanting to marry us. And he's getting us, he's getting us ready. He's, he's, wanting, he's wanting you to know, do you want to be part of the bridal party? In fact, I'd like you to be part of the people who call themselves the bride of Christ. That's how he feels about us. He wants to be with us. And I mean with in the modern sense of the word. The old King James used the word to know. Wink, wink, adults. Okay. Yes, in biblical terms. God wants that kind of intimacy with us. That's what tabernacle meant. And so he sent his son to tell us the truth. He sent his son to be the truth because he wants to call time. He wants to say, this, this is the end, what I really want for you. And he tells John here, what I really want for you, here's the vision of the future. I want you to be a part of those people who really, really, really want mostly to be with me and to see my face and to see my glory. Over the page, 22 You've heard this from me before. It's one of my defining texts in my life right now. I want you to know that it can be yours if you claim it. Revelation 22, verse 12. Behold, I am coming soon. We have held this as our belief as Adventists for generations. My grandfather, my father, and now me. And I'm telling you, Jesus is saying it's soon, so it's up to him what soon means. It may not be what I think is soon. My grandfather got killed on a Sabbath going to preach about this very thing that Jesus is coming soon, and my father preached that sermon at his funeral. So here am I telling you the same thing three generations later that Jesus is saying... Revelation 22, 12, I am coming soon, and my reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he or she has done. Now, it's simple to make the jump from the fact that what we do is a result of what we believe. So here is where we all need to look into our hearts and say, what is it that is most important to us? Today we have seen Moses tell God that what is most important to him is to see him face to face. 
question is, is that what is most important to us now? Moses never reached Canaan, my friends. He never got there. He got there in the, in the vision of the Spirit. But his most great desire was granted, I believe, by God. He saw him face to face and died. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. God identifies himself, my friends, as the great God of the universe here. And he is the one who is desperately in love with each and every one of you and me, your family, my family. In fact, the entire human family. In honor of, 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 the, of, of Black History Month, I have stopped using the word race except to refer to all of us. Because there is only one human race. We may come from different parts of the face of the earth, descendants of Shem, Ham, and Japhet, but we are all one human family. And Jesus has told Nicodemus, and he's telling us, I, I, I love you all. I, I want you all to come home with me. I want you to be the bride at the huge party that I'm going to throw, the huge wedding party that I'm going to throw. But I need this to be your deepest desire in your heart. Because if it's not, that's going to be obvious too. By what you do. Your actions are going to speak louder than your words or your thoughts. In fact, your actions will reveal your thoughts. This is how God is going to be able to give everyone, this is what the text says, it doesn't just say the good people. He is going to give everybody exactly what they want. Church, this is amazing. And he is going to be looked at as righteous because he knows the thoughts of your heart like no one else on the face of the earth. And so therefore, his judgment is without blemish. It's impeccable. There is no error in the judgment that he will make at the end when he gives everyone the deepest desires of their heart. So... Are you worried about your gold? Are you worried about taking care of your own life? Are you part of those who are dancing around the calf because God has delayed his coming? Or are you part of those who are watching? like the first angel's message says that we should be doing. That you are watching, watching to see what next move the God of creation is going to be making. Because my friends, I believe that as C.S. Lewis wrote about Aslan, Aslan is on the move. God is on the move in our world today. Yes, we have a coronavirus. Yes, we have a presidential election coming up. Yes, yes, yes. Are you watching? Not your stock portfolio. Not the gold. Are you watching God? I hope you are. And I hope that your deepest desire is to see him face to face. And also before we get there, to see his glory shown through you and the rest of his family. Because that's what will distinguish us as the people of God. Amen? Amen. Amen.